what happens when one man tries to watch all of the horror films of the 1930s? Well, we're about to find out because I'm your host, Josh Spiegel, and this is The 30s Project. Welcome to The 30s Project, where I'm trying to watch all of the horror of one of the most influential decades in the genre. Um, th this is where everything began to click with the monsters and the moods, so I thought it was high time to check them all out. And, you know, contrary to The 80s Project, I'm able to cover an entire year in a single episode. In fact, in this episode, we're checking out two full years. 30 and 31, and I'll, and I'll give you my thoughts on the film, as well as how it ranks in terms of a cultural significance to the horror world. So, let's dive in now to those dirty 30s. The decade started off on a weird note on March 15th with the release of Ingagi. It's in the form of a documentary, actually, and gives us a text crawl about an expedition to Africa in order to find a tribe in Ingagi, where they sacrifice one of their women to the local gorillas in order to stave them off, I guess, for, uh, sex. Um, so when someone tells you how we need to return to the good old moral movie-making days of old, you make sure to tell them about the 1930 movie about gorilla rape, okay? It's then a sort of expedition through the jungles with a voiceover placed over it, describing the things that they've seen on the journey. It's mostly animal antics like crocodiles on the hunt and some monkey shenanigans, and they don't even get to the tribe until a full hour into the movie, and most of that footage wasn't even for this movie. Seems it was all lifted from an existing film from 1915 called Heart of Africa. They took so much of the footage that the director of that movie's son filed a lawsuit because if you thought that it was all smooth sailing with these classic films, <laughs> think again, there's a ton of drama involved and multiple lawsuits involved with this one film, with a second one revolving around an actor who claimed to play the gorilla and was never paid. It's not just a straight documentary, though, since the film does have several fantastical elements, including the discovery of a new animal called a tortadillo that they claim is a cross between a turtle and an armadillo, but it's clearly just a turtle with some extras attached to it. The giant gorillas do finally appear in their men in suits, and, and here's the thing, when they released this one, they actually tried to pass it off as a documentary and that everything that happens was real, although it appears as if no one really fell for that. And in fact, there was an investigation by the FTC that declared that the film and its marketing were fraudulent and deceiving and had to remove any of their advertising that claimed that the proceedings were genuine. And afterwards, it was taken out of circulation. For a while, it was thought lost and remained unavailable to view anywhere. However, that designation wasn't true, since several prints did exist, and it went through a restoration process, recently being re-released in 2021. Now, you might ask yourself, this, this looks like a sort of documentary or travel film with a smattering of fake gorillas, so, so does it really qualify as belonging on a history of horror films? Well, I mean, it's included here for two reasons. One is that it was quite successful, and because of that, RKO decided to go forward with their own giant ape film that draws a handful of plot elements from this one, um, a, a little number called King Kong. The second reason is that I'm a sucker for ape suits, and my rating on this to kick off the entire decade is a mere one and a half film reels. Holy cats, is this dull. Not only that, it's super, super racist, and, and, and thankfully, looking at the roster for the rest of this journey, this is not representative of the 30s overall. Its horror cultural significance is a one and a half. This is never really talked about and is mostly forgotten. I mean, hell, it went unseen for about 90 years, so it's hard to say that it had any sort of relevance to the genre. I gave it the extra half point for making King Kong possible. Should you watch it? This is an easy, easy skip. To me, the whole thing smacked of something inhuman. The next entry didn't arrive until November 2nd, and it was another ape-inspired flick, simply called The Gorilla. Now, as far as is known, 
this one is completely lost, with no footage at all surviving, so it's not one that can be viewed. It was actually a remake of a silent film from 1927, and also a play from 25. Shortly after, there was another lost entry arriving on November 7th, or possibly on the 10th, but, but definitely early November, and it's The Cat Creeps. This is another one that was a remake of a silent film from 1927 with the same name and involves the exploits of a villainous psychopath known as the Cat. All that remains is approximately two minutes of footage, although it was remade again several more times, most notably in the 1946 film, also called The Cat Creeps. A few days later saw another film with a very similar sounding name and sort of similar premise to The Cat Creeps, and on November 13th we saw the debut of The Bat whispers, which gives us the police on the search for a mysterious criminal on the loose known as the Bat, who is straight up sending notes to his intended victims. One night he manages to pull off a rather daring crime and leaves a note saying that he's retiring to the country, and the action then shifts there as we meet Mrs. Van Gordner, accompanied by her cowardly comic relief maid and a series of circumstances that arise. It, it, it seems that there was a local bank robbery, a missing cashier, and strange sounds around the mansion, including rocks thrown through the window. And I love that Cornelia is like, hey, whatever, there's weird stuff going on, saying get out, but I really want to know what's going on, so I ain't going anywhere. She's like, like the toughest, stubborn old lady in all of film. They get word that the bat is also interested in the missing money, and the police are on hand. And uh, your age? She's 42. Jesus, how hard was life in the 20s that you have this woman in 1930 and she's 42 and looks like this? And the actress Maud Eburn was in fact 55 years old. Um, the movie then becomes a mystery of who done it, who stole the money, where is the money, and is the bat involved? And was directed by Roland West, the second to last film that he would make as his final work released in 31. And he had previously already directed a version of this. He made The Bat in 1926, and both were based on a play from 1920 called The Bat, and was one of the very first films to use the widescreen format. Besides that, it was an extremely innovative film in terms of camera work, and was one of the first films to use a smaller camera dolly for more fluid movements in shots. For a long time after its release, it was also considered lost. But when Mary Pickford, Hollywood pioneer producer, passed away, she left a considerable amount of film prints to the Library of Congress in 1979. Years later, while going through that collection, they discovered a print of the Bat Whispers and had it restored, making it available to view once more. In the time between being lost and found again, it was remade another time in 1959, again simply titled The Bat, but this time with Vincent Price and Agnes Moorhead. It's also pretty important to note that Bob Kane claimed that the look of Batman was greatly inspired by the look of the villain from this film, and IMDb says inspiration for his character, Batman, is if Bill Finger isn't a thing. And, and I'm giving this one a three and a half. It's a ton of fun. It, it's a great mix between a haunted house, murder mystery, and crime story with one hell of a badass protagonist in Cornelia Van Gordner. It, it, it does take a little too long to get going, though. Its significance is a 2.5 since it did have a bit of an impact, obviously inspiring a remake, and one of the most successful comic book characters of all time. But the film itself is still pretty unknown. Should you watch it? I'm not whispering this. Yes. And those movies represented all the horror of 1930. So we now jump directly into 1931, and the next horror film revolutionized the entire genre and changed literally everything, because on February 14th, 1931, Dracula was released unto the world. It technically premiered two days earlier, on the 12th in New York City, but went wide on Valentine's Day. 
It is, of course, an adaptation of the classic novel from 1897 by Bram Stoker, and had previously been adapted into a stage play in 1924. The book had previously been adapted in a way back in 1922 with the silent Nosferatu, although it was unofficial, and Stoker's widow sued in order to have the film moved from release, and she won, nearly destroying all copies of that film. That led the way for Universal to produce this version, which cost them around $40,000 for all the rights to the story and characters. It follows Dwight Fry as Renfield as he heads on up to Castle Dracula, which for some reason has pest control issues with possum, armadillos, and this cricket in a casket that I can never tell if it's a giant cricket in a full-sized coffin, or is it a vampire cricket and, like, the casket is tiny. Bella Lugosi took on the role of the Count, and he was already an established actor, and had played the character a number of times on stage, and was more or less known as Dracula at this point. Even with that, he wasn't the first choice for the role, as a list of more popular actors were considered before he was cast, including John Carradine, who would eventually go on to play the character elsewhere. The director was Todd Browning, already an experienced director, and it was done with a budget of $350,000, a pretty healthy number at the time. The shoot was reported to be a touch chaotic, with Browning not really present for a good deal of the filming, leaving much of the actual directing work in the hands of the cinematographer, Carl Frund. Lugosi remained in character on set, avoiding talking to the cast members, and staying in costume and referring to himself as Dracula. One thing that stands out here, as well as in some of this era's films that we'll see, is the absence of music in a variety of dramatic scenes. This was apparently done in the interests of saving money, and some theaters would have a live orchestra playing music along with it, but there was no official music for the film, save for the opening tune of Swan Lake, but later releases featured a redone score by Philip Glass. It was a huge hit upon release, becoming profitable very quickly. Of course, its influence was overwhelming, much to the chagrin of Lugosi, who found it difficult to find work afterwards, since he was so strongly associated with the role. It kicked off a whole slew of universal horror, created an entire genre, and leading the way for a generation of essential monster movies. It would have some direct sequels a little later in the decade with 1936's Dracula's Daughter, and then again in 1943 with The Son of Dracula, and then a few crossover films. The final universal version of the character arrived in 1948 in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, which was the only film in which Lugosi would return to the character, the role having been taken over by Carradine. It's regarded as one of the most important horror films of all time, and definitely one of the most important vampire films, and as such has been preserved in the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress. And this one gets a 4 from me. It's a great film with such effective mood and classic performances. It's creating an entire vibe and setting up a whole genre, but damn, I will never forgive this movie for not having an ending. Its significance is a straight-up five, though. There's no denying that this is one of the most important horror films in existence for the sake of vampire films and horror in general. Should you watch it? Yes. Uh, go listen to that sweet music it makes. I am Dracula. A few weeks later, on March 2nd, there was a more lesser-known entry with the premiere of The Drums of Jeopardy. It has... Um, Dr. Boris Karlov here, and, and you can tell he's a mad scientist as opposed to just a regular scientist because everything he's working on has fumes, and his lab has giant stone walls, and these very important flashing lights that I'm sure have an actual purpose and aren't simply there for the aesthetics. Karlov, much to everyone's surprise, is not actually played by Boris Karloff, and is instead played by Werner Oland, who would later go on to a huge notoriety for playing Charlie Chan, and in fact, his reputation was for playing a number of Asian-themed characters like Chan, and also Fu Manchu, even though Oland himself was Swedish and wasn't Asian at all. When Karlov's daughter becomes pregnant, he discovers the Drums of Jeopardy, a necklace belonging to the Petrov family, and swears revenge. He begins a reign of terror to attack them, joining the Bolsheviks in order to get after family members that joined the military, and finds out that other members are headed off to America. He and his men head over, kidnapping and attacking the Petrov family, and kicking off a game of cat and mouse. And this is another one that was a remake of an earlier silent film, this one from 1923, 
based on a novel from Harold McGrath. In the earlier version, the character of Boris Karlov had a name change to Gregor, as they wanted to avoid confusion with the actor Boris Karlov, who had recently risen to fame. In this version, however, the name was restored to Boris in order to match the original book version. The director was George Seitz, an extremely prolific filmmaker who made more than 100 films, most notably the Andy Hardy series of films that featured Mickey Rooney. And I'm giving this one a 3. It's pretty enjoyable, but honestly really nothing special, and a fairly anticlimactic finish. Its significance is only a 1.5, though, since it's not really known and didn't have any sort of impact. Should you watch it? Yeah, I'd, I'd give it a shot. It's a fun, cool revenge thriller. I have seen men die by the thousand. I have seen them shot against walls, stabbed with bayonets. But never have I seen a man low enough to betray his own brother to save his filthy hide. This next one is a bit of an oddity, and I think it's one that more people know about now than used to, because on April 24th, about two months after Dracula debuted, Spanish Dracula was unleashed. It had played in Mexico a couple of weeks earlier as well, but got a New York debut on the 24th. And if you don't know what this is, let me explain. Back in the day, it's not like they had dubbing available or even subtitles, so most films were only released in their home countries, in their native languages. At this time, some of the studios decided to try to expand their films into other markets, but in order to do so, they would actually have to film the entire thing in that language. This had been going on for a few years by this point, and Universal had put all their eggs in the Spanish-speaking basket and decided to make this film. Literally just Dracula in Spanish. It was shot on the same sets, using the same scripts, but with a different director and different actors. Todd Browning would go into the sets during the daytime and film Dracula, and when his crew would rap, director George Melford would step in and his crew would use those same sets at night, often mimicking the same shots and setups that were done for the U.S. version. It's not an exact copy, though, since it runs nearly a half hour longer and contains several scenes that are fully original. There are two actors who appear in both versions with lines, although there's several others that are background characters, and there's some rather drastic variations in performance. Uh, Carlos Villar's take on the Count is lighter and more human than Lugosi's, and a number of the women's wardrobes are clearly um, breastier. Unfortunately, the foreign language film market was not as successful as they had hoped, and nearly all of the alternate versions flopped eventually leading into the onset of dubbing, meaning this was one of the very last of the alt-language variations. For a while, it was completely forgotten, with only really historians speaking about it, and so it was sort of a lost curiosity. It, it wasn't until a print was discovered in New, New Jersey, of all places, that it started to get more widespread attention, which is, which is something good coming out of Jersey, which, which is nice, and that, that joke is for my ex, who is from Jersey, so take that, Wicked Burn, Michelle. That print, however, was missing portions of the film, uh, an entire reel, marking the portion from Renfield turning in for the day, his encounter with the brides, and the beginning of the boat trip. That reel was eventually discovered in Cuba, but in a lower quality version. It's been somewhat restored, but it's, it's still pretty obvious to see the difference in quality on the release. And I give it a 3.5. It's similar enough to the classic Dracula to be enjoyable to watch and has some of the same strengths, but I'm not a fan of Vila's Dracula, which brings it down a notch in my eyes. Its significance is a 3, though, since it's a really important side note to one of the most relevant horror films in history. Should you watch it? See, sí, es muy bueno. Soy Dracula. Our next entry arrived a month later, on May 22nd, with a film called Svengali, and begins with a woman going to meet her singing teacher, a man named Svengali, here played by the great John Barrymore, one of the classic old-school actors and grandfather of Drew. And this guy's got a whole Alan Moore thing going on with his look, and he spurns her when he finds out that she doesn't have any more money and gives her an evil look that makes her go out and commit suicide. He's essentially a leech, and is dead broke, stealing and mooching off of others, and he encounters a young model. Oh yes, modeling's my business. 
Head, hands, feet, everything, especially feet. Isn't that a pretty foot? Nobody tell Quentin Tarantino or, or, or he'll remake this. Sven hypnotizes her with his creepy eyes, and somehow the effects manage to work from across town, so it's likely that something supernatural is in effect here. They fake her suicide, and he takes her on tour as Madame Svengali, becoming a famous singer, and after five years is finally recognized by her former love. Now, this may start to sound familiar here, but this is also a remake of a silent era film. Because man, I, I know that people say that Hollywood nowadays has no original ideas and only does remakes, but this is 1931. And almost every movie I've talked about on this episode is a remake of a movie from the 1920s. So it's nothing new. But this was another one that's also adapted from a novel, one called Trilby, from George de Maurier, and has been adapted into a play and also five different film versions before this one. Most of the previous adaptations went under the title Trilby, and this was only the second take using Svengali as the title, as the character became the most known. And nowadays, when someone refers to someone as a Svengali, they're making a reference to the character from this novel. And it's weird because it's sort of on the fence in terms of being a horror movie, and it's one that film historians have actually debated as giving that classification. But if you're in any doubt, um, can I show you the hypnotism eyes again? Barrymore was actually interested in playing up the comedy of the character, trying to add more laughs into it, and he became one of the very first actors to don a pair of contact lenses for the hypno effect. It stirred up some headlines with the inclusion of this scene, which appears to be Trilby nude, and she was 17 at the time, but it's actually a body double in a body stocking. And it was actually a disappointment at the box office, but wasn't a major bust or anything. And additional versions of the story appeared later on in 1954 and 1983, with that version featuring Jodie Foster. And I give this one a three. It has a cool look and vibe and a couple of moody scenes, but it's overall a little too slow to get to the point. Its significance is a two. It's not really that well known, and most of the relevance is for the source material, but it does have Barrymore in the lead and has some notoriety. Should you watch it? I, I think so, and, and no hypnotism is necessary to compel you. It took until July 21st for another horror entry to arrive, and this one is a little clearer with the horror, and it's Murder by the Clock, which gives us old Mrs. Endicott, and she's a cranky old rich lady. And man, a lot of movies from 1931 with strong will with old women with a ton of cash. She's scared of being buried alive, so scared that she has a siren installed in her tomb and orders to leave her casket open and has a breakdown about it. Like, like this is a very strong fear that she has. She's having her family over and they're discussing her will in order to cut out one of her sons and her nephew. And that night, she's mysteriously murdered. Her meek son Philip is blamed and shortly after, she's laid to rest. And after it was revealed that it was actually nephew Herbert that did the deed, and right before they are preparing to execute the will, family members and heirs start to get bumped off. And believe it or not, this is actually an original film that hadn't had a previous version. It was, however, adapted from a novel of the same name, although only partially so, since it also took elements from a play called Dangerously Yours and mixed the two together into this new narrative. It's the first film role for Lenita Lane, who plays a very minor role in this one and would go on to star in a slew of genre films in the 1950s, including that previously mentioned Vincent Price version of The Bat Whispers. The director was Edward Slogan, who had been directing films since 1914, making him one of the earliest vets of the entire industry, and he shot over 100 films, doubling as an actor in others. And it may be slow to get going, but the ending of this one throws a pretty healthy handful of twists at you, with one of the least subtle femme fatales in the entire film world. And I'm going to give this one a two and a half. It's not bad or anything, but it's just kind of like a, a tangle of different threads that don't seem to tie up. They, they try at the end, but it, it just doesn't. Its horror cultural significance is pretty low, though, at a 1.5, since it's pretty unknown and not very relevant to the genre, without even any real noted stars in it. Should you watch it? I mean, it's not a bad watch, but it's not essential viewing either.
Here's a piece of coconut pie. Hello, hello, hello. This is Cassidy. Now listen. Sergeant Valcourt's at Mr. Hollander's apartment, 32 Manetta Lane. Get some men there in a hurry. He's in trouble. The next one is another that's a bit strange because on July 28th, there was the release of The Hound of the Baskervilles, a British film adapting the classic Sherlock Holmes tale. It wasn't the first time it was put on film and absolutely will not be the last, but it's one that can no longer be viewed. For ages, they only had the picture negative for the film, lacking any audio, so a complete print was thought to be lost. But in 1991, the soundtrack was found and the full audio was restored. After that process was completed, a single print was struck and was screened one time before being placed at the British Film Institute archives. That version has never been released and is currently not able to be seen. So in a way, it, it's once again lost. We jump all the way to November now as we near the ending of the year, and it's November 1st with the release of The Phantom. Slam Evil. It begins with a daring prison escape with a guy jumping on the top of a moving train, which is pretty wild, and it's said to be the notorious criminal The Phantom. And, and I love that he was in prison, and you have to assume that he went through a trial and all, so, so they likely know what his real name is, but they just refer to him as The Phantom. He sends a note to the DA saying that he will be at his house that evening to make a proposition. Instead, a reporter named Dick shows up helping to catch the villain for the sake of a story, but a bizarre man also appears. Turns out that Dick has been secretly engaged to John's daughter, although... Even though I'd hope someday to be able to make her my wife. And you're like 30 years older than her, man. Come on. They trace the intruder back to Doc Weldon's place, a sanitarium that's known for weird goings-ons. And what's weird is that both this movie and Murder by the Clock featured a really timid maid character as well as a comic relief cop. The thing is here as well, and there's then this series of mistaken identities and chases through the mansion, but who is the Phantom? And this one was a bit of a switch up for the director, Alan James, who mostly handled a bunch of westerns, so a horror-inspired flick was a little out of his wheelhouse. And this is breaking with the tradition of most of the other films in this list, and that it's not a remake, not a book adaptation, and not a film version of a play. It appears to be a completely original tale, written for the screen, with James also credited as the writer. And let me tell you, the story is, uh, yeah, uh, something else. It, it's like a mixture of about seven different plots, none of which ever really seem to pay off. And the ending of this movie feels like something extremely unrelated to the whole prison break opening of it all. And I'm giving this one a mere 1.5. It, it's dull as can be and, and doesn't make much sense. But at least it's a short runtime at a mere 61 minutes. Its significance is only a 1 since it's, it's pretty forgotten, lost in a myriad of other films called The Phantom. Should you watch it? Eh, this one can remain a phantom. Hello? Somebody? You better be in out. I'm coming. Better, better, better look out here. A little while later, on November 7th, we get a recurring appearance from the Savengali with the Mad Genius. That film's John Barrymore once again appears, this time with much less makeup, and he's a puppeteer with a disability obsessed with dancing. One night, a young boy is chased by a thug into his tent, and that thug is not only the boy's drunken father, but it's also Boris Karloff in a small role, and one that went uncredited. And they protect the boy, with Ivan deciding that he's going to mold him into the greatest dancer of all time. Time passes, and young Fedor grows up to become exactly that, making Ivan very rich and influential. Fedor is in love with another dancer, Nana, with Ivan using his role to take advantage of the girls in the company. He decides that Nana is interfering with his young ward's performances and decides to interfere with the help of his comic relief sidekick. Hope she doesn't recognize my typewriting. And if you think it's weird that there was two films this year that involved John Barrymore playing a sort of creepy older guy who manipulates the career of a young performer, well, it's no coincidence. 
Apparently, Warner Brothers was so happy with the modest success of Svengali that they rushed this film into production with an incredibly similar plot, pulling in not only John Barrymore, but also Marion Marsh, who plays Nana here and also played Trilby in that earlier film, making this like some sort of a spiritual sequel in a way. They pulled the basic plot out of a play called The Idol from 1929, although it was like a, a little lesser known at the time, never even being performed on Broadway. So this film was likely the most exposure that this story received. The director was Michael Curtis, who had been directing films for a while by this point, beginning his career in Hungary, and then starting to shoot in America under the name Michael Curtez, before changing it to sound more American. He's one of the most prolific directors in film history, with 178 titles under his belt, including massive hits like We're No Angels, Errol Flynn in Captain Blood, Flynn again in The Adventures of Robin Hood, The Jazz Singer, but most importantly, this is the guy who directed Casablanca. For the most part, it's not very horror-related, even less so than Svengali, mostly dealing with the drama and tension between these three characters, but the ending gives us murder threats and a bona fide axe killing, so it, it makes up for it. And this one is a three for me. It's got some good stuff happening, but it felt redundant after Svengali and didn't have that one's stylistic flares, but did have a more cohesive plot. Its significance is a two, since it's by a very notable director and features Barrymore, but again, never really reached any sort of mainstream importance. Should you watch it? I mean, it's worth a watch. Again, if you've already seen Svengali, it's really not essential. Now, during all this time, the girls are dancing in front of these little Spanish shawls. They're dancing there, Spanish music. But in the center, there's a very large shawl. You keep wondering what on earth could be behind that large shawl. Well, the girls keep dancing behind these little shawls, and some men come in, and they take away that big shawl, and you discover what was behind that shawl. It's a girl, too, but it's a big girl. Another massive monster of a hit unveiled on November 21st, and when I say monster, I'm talking about the man himself, Frankenstein. Again, it technically had a premiere two days beforehand, just like Dracula did, but it actually debuted on the 19th in Detroit, but the 21st is when it was a wider release. It's the tale of Henry here, and I, I bet you thought I was going to say Victor, but this is Henry here. And along with his sidekick, and I bet you think I was going to say Igor here, but nah, this dude is Fritz. Igor doesn't show up until later, but, the, but these two are grave robbing, hunting for a brain. They decide to rob a school for one, but oopsie, Fritz drops the good brain and has to settle for the one that belonged to Abby Normal. Henry has a friend named Victor, and yeah, that's not confusing at all, considering the character in the book is Victor, and not Henry, and has a fiancé named Elizabeth. And I mentioned a book, because this is, of course, like Dracula, based on a pre-existing novel and play. The book was Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, from Mary Shelley, which she wrote when she was a mere 21 years old. The 1818 novel was made into a play in 1927, and after Dracula was a huge sensation, Universal was excited to crank out more horror product and rushed Frank into production. Initially, they had thought to put Bella Lugosi in there as well, but he wanted to play the doctor, and the producers wanted him as the monster, and he ended up passing. Although, it, it's a little unclear if he actually said no, or if he was booted off the project. Uh, it seems that the original director, Robert Flory, was also fired as soon as James Whale asked to direct it. And considering that, that he was a bit of a name at the time, they gave it to him. It's said that he cast Karloff as the monster, mainly because Karloff bore a resemblance to him. And it's possible that Lugosi was shipped off like Flory. There was one other major carryover from Dracula, though, since Fritz is played by Dwight Fry, who also held the role of Renfield in that one. One weird note about it is that in the opening credits, it's said that the original book was by Mrs. Percy B. Shelley, as Mary was married to him at the time, although it's a curiosity that she was credited as that instead of, you know, just Mary Shelley. Also, earlier, I mentioned that they had changed the name of Victor Frankenstein to Henry, which I guess they did because the name Victor was considered unfriendly and severe, and they wanted the character to be seen as likable, unlike his book counterpart, who was a darker guy. So they swapped his name, 
with his friend Henry. Of course, it was a smash hit, earning a ton of cash at the box office, making a massive profit, and ensuring that Universal would remain in the monster business for quite a while. Obviously, sequels would follow, and in 1935, there was a direct follow-up, Bride of Frankenstein, which we'll talk about shortly, but the character has been in dozens of films by this point, although most unofficial and not truly connected to this one. Attempts by Universal to remake the story never really happened. I mean, sure, there were other versions of the story, but they were from different studios, nearly different adaptions of the novel as opposed to Universal-sanctioned remakes. In fact, the biggest effort by the company to give another shot at the tale was from Guillermo del Toro, who put an effort into doing this story for years, although it never came to fruition. But it looks like it is finally, finally happening, so we'll probably have that within the next year or so. When they were planning on doing the whole Dark Universe thing, they had another shot at it, lining up Javier Bardem as the monster, but after the mummy debacle, it was cancelled. And this is great. I give this one a 4, since it's one of my favorite Universal classics, although I definitely understand why people prefer the sequel. It's HCS is a straight 5, though. It's Frankenstein. Damn it, do I need to say anything else? Should you watch it? I mean, it's almost a requirement. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. 1931 ends in an appropriate way with a film that premiered in Los Angeles on December 24th, Christmas Eve, and in New York on December 31st, New Year's Eve, and it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It got a wider release around the country a few days later on January 3rd of 1932, so like Dracula and Frankenstein, I could have dated this one on the general release date, but it seemed like a fun way to end the year, so I'm, so I'm placing it here. So, in case you're unfamiliar with this one, it starts with a very early POV shot, including a cool mirror trick to introduce us to Dr. Henry Jekyll, and he's played by the great Frederick March. And he's determined that man is made of two sides, a good side and an evil side, and he wants to marry Muriel, but her father is making them wait. One night he comes to the aid of a prostitute named Ivy, who does a striptease for him, but mainly for the camera, in a rather saucy and scandalous scene for the time. Jekyll decides that he wants to purge the evil side from his body and comes up with a formula, and can I sidebar to talk about how all these old movies have everything come down to just some liquid that people drink? Like, what's in that liquid in modern science terms? Is it some sort of a massive drug stimulant or whatever? Anywho, he takes the formula, leading to this amazing transformation scene, and wow, is that amazing, and can only be done with black and white film. You see, it's done by having him wear a colored makeup and holding a colored filter in front of the camera. The filter combo makes the makeup invisible, more or less, and then when the shot is rolling, they remove the filter, and the makeups show. The secret of this effect was kept under wraps and wasn't revealed until after the director's death. Jekyll transforms into Hyde here, a simian-looking dude and vaguely like a monkey Jeff Goldblum. He heads out onto the town, causing some chaos, encountering Ivy, and kicking off a battle between the two sides. And this was a super prestigious release, and I think a lot of people lump this one in with the Universal Monsters, but this was actually released by Paramount. It was an adaptation of the 1886 story of the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, and had previously been a play, but was also put on film as well, several times. But the most popular up until that point was a 1920 U.S. version. This version is notable for a whole lot of reasons, but the first is the addition of the Ivy character, who wasn't in the story or plays. John Barrymore was hoped to play the role of Jekyll and Hyde, since he handled the role in the 20 version, but his contract with MGM prevented it, and when they suggested March, it was met with some contention. But it ended up paying off, since he won an Oscar for it. He tied for Best Actor with Wallace Beery from The Champ, and was nominated for Adapted Screenplay and Cinematography, and is known as the first horror film to win an Academy Award. 
It was a big hit and rivaled Dracula and Frankenstein at the box office, making a nice profit, but its half a million dollar price tag make it a little less of an earner than those others. And it also got overwhelmingly positive reviews, becoming a strong competition for Universal's slate of creatures. And my rating on this one is a four. This one is great. Uh, such a such a fantastic movie with some amazing effects scenes and some innovative filmmaking. I, I love this one. It's pretty pretty awesome. Its horror cultural significance is also a four and a half. Um, it's obviously one of the most powerful versions of this story, and being one of the very first horror films to ever win an Oscar makes it a bit of a bigger deal than others. Should you watch it? Oh, absolutely. This is a good, fun time. You who have sneered at the miracles of science. You who have denied the power of man to look into his own soul. You who have derided your superiors. Look. So there you have it, all of the horror films of 1930 and 1931. I think my absolute favorite in this block has got to be Frankenstein. I have a soft spot for that monster. Love that guy, and I love that movie. Um, but I'd love to hear what of these that you've seen, and what are your favorites down below. If you have a particular interest in this, I know some of these are definitely much more obscure, but quite a few of these I think are pretty commonly seen. So let me know which one you've enjoyed, and which other ones you would now like to seek out. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. If you enjoy what you see on the channel, of course, subscribe to it, and check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movietimelines, where you can help support this channel like these guys do. I appreciate that, and I appreciate you watching, and we'll see you when we go into a whole nother year, 1932, the next time on The 30s Project.